Welcome to the HC Insider Podcast, a podcast dedicated to the commodities sector and the people within it. I'm your host, Paul Chapman. Today we return to the subject of hedge funds in commodities. Since our last episode on the subject, hedge funds have become more prominent in the sector as more investment flows into hedge funds and hedge funds have an increasingly powerful voice in the talent landscape. But what does it take to build and run a successful hedge fund in commodities? What are the attributes that potential employees but investors should look for when thinking of where to deploy their capital? Commodities are a unique asset class. They offer great diversification and much higher volatility than other sectors, but along with that comes great risk. Our guest has run a successful commodities hedge fund for the past six years, Tor Svelland. Tor has had a long career as a trader in shipping, in investment banks and in trading houses, and launched Svelland Capital six years ago. And in this episode, we're going to lean on his expertise and experience in this sector to unpick what it means and what it takes to be a successful hedge fund in commodities. As always, you can really support the show by leaving a positive review on the platform you're currently listening on and supporting us through social media. And finally, as always, I hope you enjoy the episode. Tor, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Paul, for having me. So I, I see this almost as a part two to an episode we did two years ago, really leaning into the history of hedge funds in the commodities sector, um, which remains very relevant today and, and really updating it because part of the story of the last two years since we did that episode has been the continued rise of the hedge funds, both from participation in the market and then interest in getting into the market. And they've been a major move on talent. But it's quite a complex picture, both for individuals considering joining a hedge fund, but also investors looking into them. So let's 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 start the conversation where it should start, which is Tor. Can you give us a, a little background on who you are, because it's going to be relevant to this discussion? Yeah. So hi there. So uh, my name is Tor Svelan. I'm a Norwegian. I started in the commodity shipping business back in 1989 in Oslo after some years learning in the early stage of the basic of shipping, literally being on board the vessels, you know, being in the ports and, and really knowing it by heart. I moved to Greece to learn the Greek way of the same business, which I found uh, very interesting. It's very different of the way the Norwegian are thinking compared to the Greeks, both uh, successful in this industry, but different way of uh, approaching the market. I later moved back to Norway, worked for a, a company called Klavnes, very advanced in the trading back in the 90s, probably one of the most, most advanced uh, companies, I would say. Also, the interesting thing with that company that was uh, very open-minded to traveling. So I traveled Middle East, India many times, I've uh, been to many, many cities and ports, and all over Asia. So that was a good and steep learning curve uh, in the business. I later on uh, joined uh, more on the banking side. So I joined Carnegie back in 2005. And the whole idea when I joined was to start a long short between the asset classes. So we traded equities, long short versus freight futures and commodity futures. I'm not going to say that we were the first one, but I think we were quite early into that game. That turned out to be successful and a repeatable business. I moved to London, worked for Goldman Sachs on the oil desk, traded freight derivatives and, and the oil complex. Moved to Geneva, worked for Trafigura, was responsible for one desk uh, and trading across the firm, both equities, uh, the fiscal market and, and freight futures. Then uh, after all these years with experience, I uh, thought it was the time, right time to start Swelling Capital and, and found it. Took 11 months to set it all up, set it up properly from day one. And we have now been up and running for almost yeah, five and a half, six years. And I know it's a bit of an aside, but very, if it's possible to have a brief answer, what is the difference between the Norwegian and the Greek way of doing shipping? The Norwegian are more into finding new markets, finding new technology, and explore more the, the technical side. Compared to the Greeks, they have much more like buy and more standard asset and, and be better on timing. I think that's kind of the difference. I would say both are very successful, 
just uh, very interesting to learn that the Greeks way of timing the market has been, as we all know over the years, been very successful. And there's a thread there as well, which we'll come on to about who succeeds typically in the commodities hedge fund sector or financial trading, you know, often have backgrounds in the physical markets that they operate within, because that's the crucial knowledge compared to, say, someone who's in equities where, you know, it's all research driven, etc. So so we'll come back to that. Let, let's start at the basics. For, for all of us, let's get on the same page about what do we mean by a hedge fund versus, say, a trading house and a bank and so forth. And then I want to talk about their, their role and impact on the commodity markets today. But can we start there? So how, how do you define a hedge fund versus those other market participants? So when you have just in general note, uh, what most people are exposed to when it comes in the funds industry is uh, the long only funds. Then you have a, a different way of running uh, positions in the market is by running it in a hedge fund strategy or a hedge fund setup. A hedge fund in the in the good old days and uh, what is supposed to be is a hedge fund is a, a long short equities uh, versus commodities etc. Many are also using the and uh, describing themselves as a hedge fund but they're just actually long only and that's where it's a kind of a a misunderstanding so a hedge fund should outsmart the market over time they should be able to make good pnl whether the market is up or is down they should uh, have less correlation to the overall indexes yeah yeah of course those same tools are now used by the banks and the trading houses right what uh, i guess is the function of a hedge fund in the market? I mean, you know, how have they changed the commodities sector just in the six years that, you know, Svelin Capital has been operating? There's been a lot of impact on the commodities markets themselves. Is that correct? Yes. I would say the way I experienced the, the way the commodity hedge fund was acting in the market back in the 2005, 6, 7. And also I would say the experience I had from 2009, 10, 11, 12, they were quite wide the way they traded into the commodity space. And uh, when you're trading commodities, I think one of the reason if you want to succeed that you are more focused, you, you handle and you trade those commodities, you know, by heart and you really know the supply demand. In the second, you start being too wide, meaning you are investing into too many different commodities. And you don't really follow the supply demand. You don't really know the key players in the market. I think you easily could face problems with your trading. Hence, what I saw back then, most commodity hedge funds traded all kinds of commodities. And I must say it's a very big difference between knowing the coal market to the iron ore market, to the oil market, to gold, silver, and uh, then topping up with the copper and eggs. So in the way I'm thinking, and uh, I think what is why well, we may have been successful, that we are sticking to less commodities, but we rather trade the freight around those commodities, and we are trading equities that are related to those freight futures and commodity futures. Yeah, and we're going to come on to what, what in your mind makes funds successful so that people can have some kind of assessment toolkit when they're thinking about this. The other a big big challenge or trend that has happened over the last decade has been the rise in systematic trading as well, which I guess is for those that are reliant less on the fundamentals and more pattern following and pattern prediction. How has that changed? You know, even if you do have the right fundamental uh, argument, it can sometimes be very hard to swim against that, you know, when you've got a legion of algorithms going against you. Yeah, so we are always following the, the, the CTA, so the, the trend following funds and uh, the overall macro funds and also the, the multi-platforms. So it's always um, you know, important to understand what they think about the market and how they will act. And especially on the trend following the CTAs, they are reading the market differently to what I would say that what we will normally do, and also I think a, a, a general trading house. They are looking for a trend. 
and uh, what is up or down, it doesn't matter. And they will rather looking for signals to increase position when they found a trend and they continue trading that trend. So they don't look into the supply demand in the same way that we will do. And I will say the, the trading houses. So when they start kind of uh, going in one direction, it will be a lot of capital following it and they will just continue adding on to one strong trend. So when they start pushing in one direction, they can be a very important part of the market uh, in which uh, price action we are ending up with. So do they have the, the recipe for a success in the commodity market? That uh, we will see the, the next few years because they, they have got a lot of inflow into those um, CTAs. So we just have to be humble and, and see how they keep trading and also uh, watch the their, their normal signals, what they see in the market and when they're acting both ways, both long and short. So, you know, some futures are kind of Asian, meaning that they are settled over the whole month. Uh, then you have other futures, they're called bullet, meaning they are ending one specific day or in the end of one month. Then you have the role, uh, you can't just the financial settle because uh, underlying uh, market and, and then you kind of have to act differently. So uh, I wouldn't be surprised uh, going forward that uh, since they have the role and if you have large position in the front month, that could create big swings in, in the future, as long as the CTS are at uh, today's uh, AUM. Yeah, so all of these kind of major trends and functions or outputs, if you'd like, are things like the indexes, these long-only funds are going to get amplified just by the amount of money that's flowing into commodities. Yeah. And let's move on to that. So so how much money has gone, you know, you, you have, your career has both sort of spanned the different, the physical and the financial, the different actors and players in the space, you know, over the last 25 years as kind of, you know, the, the, the banks came in and then the, you know, and then the trading houses and the trading houses then put hedge funds on top of their, which will come back to their physical books. Back in 2000, 11 12 there was a lot of money a, a big story flowing to commodities that was launching a lot of funds that was the last time kind of the some of the big multi-asset class hedge funds started building teams can you just talk us a little bit about that investor journey where we're at today and then who are the typical hedge you know who are we talking about when we're talking about hedge fund investors so the hedge fund investors are everything from the family offices around the world and more the institutional investors right now i think the majority of the investors that is invested into the commodity hedge funds they are mainly family offices we uh, are clearly seeing signals that uh, the institutionals are on the way in and would like to be more involved there are some bad stories back from 2011 12 13 I think the uh, large institution, they are very careful in their consideration in who to invest with and, and what kind of strategy they're actually following. We have some very good managers out there on the pure oil. We have some others on, on pure gas. My impression is that the institutions are looking for more a uh, crossover, not too wide and, and, uh, and see that the steady return. They're not looking for the, the big numbers, like 60-70% uh, is more like steady and uh, a strong risk management. The institutional investors, from my point of view, they're only 10% invested right now into the commodity space. So we have uh, quite a lot of money that uh, would like to be engaged into this market. So you think that 10%, how high could that go? So the way I see the overall metals market, oil and shipping, we have been underinvested since uh, 2014, 15, 16. Shipping maybe had some more money available till uh, let's say 2017, 18. But after that, that has also been shut. Overall, the, the lenders, trade finance has been very limited the last few years. 
and uh, when the ESG market uh, was the main theme in 2019-2021, is even made the commodity market even more difficult to raise capital. So, I since we are so underinvested and people now realizing that we need to explore more on the oil, we need to get more rigs involved, we need more uh, mining, more capital to mining, and we literally need more ships. Uh, you know, the world fleet gets older every day. So uh, I think we can uh, apply maybe uh, up to 60, 70%. Wow. Um, and, and then, because uh, it is pertinent to the story we're about to tell, you mentioned there that the institutionals had a bit of a torrid time of it in 2013, 2014. And fundamentally, you would assume that's because commodity prices collapsed. But again, it's kind of, you know, we started with this definition of hedge funds that can make money when markets are going up and make money when markets are going down. What happened? Why Why was it so challenging for the hedge fund space to, you know, how torrid was it and why was that? I think the commodity hedge funds back in that period was uh, quite large uh, for the market and they were uh, using leverage and uh, quite aggressive the way of trading. I think that when you are a commodity hedge fund, and you're not part of the fiscal market, you are mainly using futures, then you have to remember that uh, on the other side of the trade, in many cases, it's a fiscal trading house, or it could be an oil company. And you have to respect that they know the market quite well as well. And to try to be too big part of the, like, the open interest of a future can uh, sometimes uh, put you into a very difficult position. So it's much better from my point of view to trade the market from a very humble stand and use the volatility in your favor instead of trying to dominate the market and understand when ARPs are opening and closing and, and take that into consideration. I think the hedge funds back then was a bit too aggressive involved in too many commodities. And as we all know, anything can happen. It's always political risk into the commodity market. With always some weather, so you know we will always have some kind of surprises uh, along the way. And and that is so. The fascinating part of the story for me as well is how different and how difficult, if I can say it, commodity trading is when you compare to the other asset classes that these hedge funds, at least the multi-asset class hedge funds, are typically aware of. Right, equities, bonds, where their DNA sits. Commodities is so different. Um, you mentioned volatility. You mentioned sort of event driven. Can you just talk to us about and help us understand? You know, if you all sat in front of you know Torsvell and God forbid sat in front of a, a multi asset class hedge fund and saying you, this is why commodities is so different and I have to be able to trade it differently. The equity market is uh, based on that. If the equity market goes up, majority of the market participants are winners. In the commodity space, it's different. You know, you have literally a winner and a loser. You have one going long and one going short. So the dynamic is very different. For the hedge fund or the multi-platforms, the people that are trading outside the, the larger trading shops or the oil companies, they always have to keep in mind that when they are trading, who is involved and um, the volatility. We have the starch in an Asian time, it's trading during the European times and it's normally finishing quite late. And uh, the equity market is so different. So I think that's maybe some that everyone that is getting involved have to remember the difference between the asset classes or how they actually work. Also the scale of volatility and the fact that these sort of the volatility comes in big chunks but relatively infrequently throughout the year compared to, you know, what you might be seeing just trading equities, you know, with 1% here and there every day. Yeah, the, the, we have also learned now the, over the last, especially since we had a inflation worries and then straight into recession in, in June, July, the recession hasn't happened yet, but still the headlines was uh, recession and inflation. I think the, the volatility is, is attractive for those who likes it. It's just uh, when you find a trend and you have the multi-platforms involved, the uh, large macro funds, and you have the CTAs, 
and you have the large trading houses. It's just uh, important to kind of try to understand what the different participants in the market are looking for. And when they think a trade is kind of done and when we are, we can take profit or, or, or stop themselves out. Uh, I just think it's important to try to understand the overall who are part of this market, what is the kind of the, the, the rules in the game, and, and then uh, try to take benefit from there. It just works very different to the the pure financial markets. Yeah, you yeah you you have sort of yeah this bifurcation between the physical world and it, I guess it helps that you've worked in or, or to have worked in all of those different types of players, so you can put those lenses on to be able to to trade. Is it is it fair to say though? There's kind of I, I don't know. I think I say it quite often that you know if you're in a hedge fund trading commodities, there are only these sort of two or three or four kind of opportunities to make real money throughout the year compared to kind of how maybe equities trading works? I think um, there are opportunities every day. It's all about looking for it, try to find, you know, spreads opportunities. And, uh, you know, you can be long or you can be short, you can do short term trading or you can take more uh, longer stand. It's just about understanding the dynamics in the in the commodity market and the shipping market, that uh, if you don't have the access to the commodities or uh, access to the cargos, you have a supply issue on, on the commodity side. And if you don't have the access to the, the cargos and the shipping, you know, the market could be quite dramatic in the sense of maybe a way of explaining it is that in the shipping market, when you have two ships and one cargo, the market will decline in most cases. And it won't decline with one or two percent. It could decline with 10, 20, 30 percent or even more. And the same the other way around. If you have two cargoes and one ship, the market can go up quite a lot. Uh, the same we have in the, in the commodity space. Most people are used to a commodity market literally from the mid 90s to literally the financial crisis in 2008 and 9, when it was kind of one big buyer, which was China. And it was, it was everything about the demand story. So when the market was weak, it was China was buying less. And when they were full on, you know, with a 14% GDP, they bought literally whatever they could get their hands on. This time around is different. Now it's a supply story. We have a fairly strong demand. We will even with a, I would say, a, a weak demand story and maybe into a mild recession, we will still have a strong demand for commodities the important thing is that we don't have the supply because it's so underinvested take a copper market as an example we have peru and chile as the main producers they recently learned that the political situation in both countries are not that in favor of actual production and mining so when the two largest producers are could face difficulties on the production then it's not about we could have a two percent reduction or three it could be a much bigger number and then we will quick learn with a strong demand side due to electrification etc we could easily be very very strong supply demand situation the same we see now right in the in the fiscal crude market we have uh, a fairly balanced market, market trades between 85, 86, 87 dollars. But the market, from a historical point of view, was always putting in a premium for some supply issues. Right now, we have zero premium in the market for supply issues. So we are now expecting supply from Libya, Nigeria, and let's say Iraq will be going as nothing can happen. And that's, uh, I find interesting. That's kind of new to me uh, over all this year that we are suddenly trading a market that is, uh, our, you know, trust the supply side. And we have a tendency to learn over the years in these markets that we will get surprises. So mm. my, my view is that we will have further supply issues across uh, metals, oil and shipping. Yeah. I think the story of the next decade, as we've sort of been telling on this podcast as well, is kind of one of volatility 
and not least obviously you know from the people angle as well there's you know lots of challenges there even even if the projects are uh, finance and so on but that brings us to a fundamental point which is you're in a hedge fund and you've essentially left all of the physical tendrils that you would have in a trading house and the assets and the ability to see some of these trends arguably earlier than your average market participant using your examples how do you find out that there's going to be two cargoes two ships turning up for one cargo that has such a dramatic impact and secondly okay I, the theory you know it sounds excellent but how do you get ahead of the market when everyone fundamentally there's so much transparency about these supply issues like talking about how do you build up a sort of defensive capability within a hedge fund that's sustainable in terms of your ability to translate proprietary market information into a strategy i think you learn over many many years i think experience is very important i think you can learn the equity market and do company research by diving into a spreadsheet and you can come up with a buy or sell or a neutral i think in the commodity market is different i think that uh, understand the overall picture uh, most commodities are worldwide uh, you have to understand the political situation, the growth in the market, the money flow, and and uh, you know also be humble for the the weather that could uh, have impact on on the situation. So, in order to try to build up a sensible uh, portfolio uh, in the commodity space, it's always important to also have the, the shorts in place in case you are more optimistic and more bullish on the market uh, and uh, be prepared that we will have setbacks and uh, then how you can actually handle when we have setbacks. From my own experience, I've been on the right side when we had some uh, tremendous uh, weather issues and uh, accidents in the commodity space and also been on the wrong side. So, you know, uh, you have learned how painful it could be. So. I think it's important to take that into your day-to-day -day operation and, and the way you, you make up your portfolio that uh, you will be surprised and be prepared for. The HC Insider podcast is brought to you by HC Group, a retained search, intelligence and advisory firm focused solely on the global energy and commodity sector. With six locations across Asia, Europe and the Americas and over 50 consultants. To find out more, go to our website, hcgroup.global. There, you can also sign up for our HC Insider content for more interviews and white papers on relevant trends and talent impacts in the commodities world. Let's move on to what, what makes a fund successful. And I think there's sort of a microcosm there in the individual because I think it can be really challenging as an individual to kind of understand and sort of recognize the roots of your success in the organization you are and how much you may or may not rely on all of those the the physical system the assets all these pieces you know the conversations over the desk the, there's a hearsay about a particular event in a, a tiny part of the market that can have cascading results that are you cannot replicate at a hedge fund if you're just sat there with a, a screen and sat next to an equity trader but that's sort of the individual sort of self-reflection that gets you to that point whether you think you can make it in this world. What do you think it, if you're sort of looking to deploy money into a into a commodity hedge fund, which we've already alluded to, has a pretty rocky ride? You know, there are relatively few that have sustainably made money over the long term. What you know, what do you think the attributes are that you would look for in a hedge fund that is focused on commodities to know whether it's got a good shot or not? The number one for me will be the background on the people that they can uh, prove that they have done this for years, have a, a good track record. And uh, second, that they have a strong understanding of the fiscal market and they really understand the supply demand. And uh, also last part on the risk management that they are not uh, constantly trying to go for extreme returns but try to do more moderate and uh, always have back of the mind that it's a day tomorrow and uh, it's more important to make good PL and good uh, return over the long term than just uh, the short term percentage returns kind of what for you sort of 
ticks the box in terms of good, solid, sustainable returns versus that swinging for the for the for the fences. I think uh, in the equity and the bonds, you know, in in some cases you have institutional investors looking for five, six, seven percent, depends a little bit on the on the ten year and the interest market. In the commodity space, I think uh, investors in general are looking for a higher return due to the nature of the business and, and uh, higher risk and uh, it's more exotic. So um, I would say that a uh, 15% is reasonable as a, an average over many years. And uh, then you will have some good years and you will have some bad years. But uh, if you are steady at 15% and, and higher, that should be achievable and that should be attractive to the to the wider investor market. Well, so you double your money in five years or so, just under. So not too, uh, not too bad. Yeah. What about this idea of specialization? Like, can we crack that nut? I mean, it seems to me that, again, if, I, if you look at the big names, Centaurus, for example, they were really successful. They were very laser focused on a couple of commodities. They were owned and run by people who had had a long career in those commodities, almost from inception of their, you know, and deeply, deeply understood the physical, and then kind of hung their boots up when some of those, there have been such macro shifts in the market that their knowledge no longer really applied, or they, in that case, they probably made too much money. But can we just talk about specialization? How specialized do you need to be? And is it possible not to be specialized and be successful in commodities over the long term? So there are some very talented and uh, you know the result speaks for himself and uh, and that's uh, very impressive what uh, several managers out there have been uh, been achieving me personally i think that you know to be involved in in more commodities is better uh, if you just trade one you're also ending up that uh, you have to do something and you have to have a view and if you trade several commodities that you can leave if you don't have a strong connection by the being optimistic or, or more negative to the market, you know, it's better to, to, to have more to play on. If you just trade one commodity, like we have seen from few managers, you know, uh, they will also in some cases be part of the market. So when they call it right, it goes extremely well. But when on the wrong side of the trade, it tends to be quite dramatic on the, on the, on the downside. And uh, if you then take the institutional investor uh, hat on you know they're always enjoying the the big moves up but uh, the downside in many cases are literally just too big for them to handle and some guys you know is the the gentleman or the the, the woman that uh, gave the the allocation uh, but in many cases for the investment committee in the large institution it's uh, just too tough for them to actually to handle those big uh, drawdowns does scale have a quality of its own as well like what at what point are you too small and, and maybe at what point are you too big i mean can you just talk to help us understand that dynamic as well yeah when you take the the overall cost to run a, a commodity hedge fund i would say to run anything below 250 million dollars is probably too small then you can be one billion for sure in many cases you can be one and a half to two it all depends then uh, how many people you have actually trading and how many commodities. But uh, I think a, a good sweet spot for the commodity from my angle and my view is between one to two billion dollars. And um, what generates that sort of upper cap if you'd like? You just become too big that there's just too much capital to deploy and, and that therefore starts impacting the markets themselves? The way I think uh, is the best way of creating good returns in this market is being active being trading the market, be on top of the information flow and, and kind of create uh, some kind of PL, not almost every day. If you just put on position and watch them and uh, more like you hope it will go up or you're bearish and you're shorting the market and you want to go down. I'm in the camp that I like more the that trading hat on and be, be active and, and really see that if you see a change in the market, you can use that. Uh, due to the nature of the volatility in this industry, I think there are a lot of trading opportunities. And as a concept, you make $50,000 a day on just being active. It's, in the end of the year, it's uh, contributing uh, quite a lot to you to your positive PL. So I think just uh, being active is, uh, is important. I think also 
for the institutional and many of the family offices, they don't have the capacity to be active themselves. So it's more attractive to those investors to see active manager than someone just putting on a position and leave it because that they can actually do themselves. You know, in the end of the day, when you put whatever commodity futures or freight futures on, you have to roll them, you have to follow them closely, you have to make sure that you don't do any mistakes if the market is in contango preparation. So I think that that's uh, the reason why this opening up a lot of opportunities going forward. If you can provide that kind of service to the to the broader market, then uh, and, and and you know make sure that they engage in the commodity space, you get a better price action. There will be more money being made, and we will also see maybe opportunities that we will see more supply and money available for more uh, mining, oil exploration, etc. Hmm. Uh, which I think we will need because we are in a very tight supply market and uh, this can't continue. I mean, we are all hear about electrification and we hear about the, the renewable story. I happen to be quite involved and uh, we have to match up with the fiscal commodities in order to that we will succeed uh, with a, a greener future. Yeah, and also make sure you know, it's an orderly transition, right? The world looks very different very quickly when the oil runs out, uh, you know, trebles in price. Okay, so so there are. I think you've laid it out really. There's, you know, perhaps unlike any other previous time, there's just an incredible amount of opportunity across all commodities with these, you know, with this supply story and multiple pathways available to energy transition lots of volatility within that there's more more opportunity than ever and actually apart from it just being an investor story now it really i think is the industrial sort of revolution of you know that we're going through over the next 10 years 20 years in, in terms of energy transition so investors not only want to be in it for the opportunity they actually need to be in it for the strategic and seismic shift it's going to generate that's my pitch but the there are some also challenges to hedge funds as well. Can you, you know, what are the, compared to say 10 years ago, you know, we're facing a lot higher, well, tech costs, scrutiny, all of these things. Can you just sort of, to maintain your edge, where are the pain points for a hedge fund today? I think um, the, the portfolio managers that you have uh, in your fund, in most cases, will do a lot of uh, research themselves on a daily basis. It's not like you just have a lot of analysts or research people around you that can constantly tell you what to put on or not. Uh, the commodity PMs are a bit different to the equity. They will be leaning towards uh, some of the key uh, banks out there uh, on their research. Then you will normally buy commodity research from more the specialist ones, which uh, I think that there are a few out there that are doing a very good job. You know, we also have uh, several that's popped up over the last years that is selling shipping data. I think that in, in many cases, some can be used. Uh, in some cases, it's not, uh, you can't literally use it because it's uh, too many units and uh, you can't see any trading patterns out of it. But overall, the, the hedge funds can buy quite good research. But in the end of the day, it's all about each PM and their deep knowledge of the of the industry. Yeah, and the world hasn't been making many commodity trading PMs over the last decade, you know, since 2012, really, right? There is a talent gap there as well, which is leading to some of the sort of the eye-watering prices that uh, swirl around the market, especially this time of year, you know, bonus season. Oh, that's correct. And um, commodities uh, has been very out of favor. I remember when I decided to set up my own fund, and I spoke to some of the largest allocators in the market, and I said, uh, we wish you the best of luck. You will succeed, but you will struggle to raise capital because the market is not paying attention to this uh, market. And hence the reason during the same period from 15, 16 till recently, no one has been <laughs> applying for jobs. Uh, a lot of talents has gone to more the tech part and, and also into the renewable space. So uh, we had a quite long period of time when talents has just been looking for other opportunities. I think that some of the trading houses out there has been very smart. Uh, they have been 
looking for uh, you know uh, having training programs inviting young candidates with a strong academic background and also candidates without strong academic background and been able to you know finding their own talents i mm. think that's been a very wise way of approaching the market and uh, right now uh, the way it looks from my point of view is that the world is a bit short of good uh, you know portfolio managers and, and general commodity traders and uh, we would uh, need uh, more people to engage yeah you know as i keep saying <laughs> the trade the real world you know the fiscal market and uh, you know the whole story we had now for many many years that if you own uh, nasdaq long you are fine if you are invested in whether it's google or microsoft or or apple you're set for life and that's been a very from my point of view an easy nice trade for 10 years i think that trade has kind of come a little bit to an end and we have to go back to basic and um, appreciating that uh, we need all the commodities out there and we need people to 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 mine explore and, and uh, we need the ships to move the cargoes from a to b yeah and it's not i mean you you mentioned trading houses having these graduate training programs there's one in particular i think they've done a fantastic job and you can just see it in the average age of their people they to my mind are an outlier I, you know, I don't think many others have the, had the scale, desire, or the capacity to do that. And we're also at a time when every physical producer, be it metals, miners, oil majors, whatever it might be, also recognize the need to have tra trading and optimization of marketing programs that get them closer to their customer, help them manage that volatility, and help them capture that margin that they would otherwise be giving up. So they're also drawing on talent as well. I mean, it is a, a talent short space out there, just to sort of I guess, emphasize that point. And it is what it is, right? You know, and until we can attract more graduates back to the sector and more firms invest in graduate programs. Well, one, one, another, I guess, question on those sort of headwinds. We've done an episode on the financialization of the oil markets and kind of you know, the granularity of these contracts now that that means that so there's there's less of a divergence between the physical and the financial. We've done a couple of episodes on systematic trading. We've got one coming up as well. How much do you need to lean into technology just to at least understand what those CTAs are doing and how that might impact the trades that you're doing? Or do you just, it is what it is and that's just a separate world and you just ignore it? No, I think it's very important to to fully understand what the other market participants are are up to how they how they look at the market and how how they taking positions and uh on the there are some really good macro funds out there and uh you know last year where did they make their money most likely more on the on the bond side than and uh, than actually the commodity space even though they maybe were more involved. Oil, after all, in 2022 started uh, and ended more or less flat. Then uh, we had a long period where the, the copper market last year looked really, really strong. Some market participants was uh, very aggressively short and rolled them quite cleverly and managed to, to actually keep a quite bullish market quite low for longer. So, but this could change this year. So, so let's see how things develops there. Yeah. Just back to one thing you mentioned on, on the, on the talents out there. I think we have to remember that if you go back to 2019 and 20, I just moved back to Norway from Switzerland. So in Norway, we have a, it's now called Equinor. It used to be called Statoil. And uh, if you, in the good old days, worked for Statoil and later on then Equinor, then you have uh, been uh, done well at school and uh, you have a great future. So it's a, even though it's, a, you know, it's owned by the Norwegian uh, government, it's uh, always been considered as a very good, well-run company. Then when I came back to Norway uh, in 2018 and, and, and talked with different people in, in Equinor, and I sensed that people was almost afraid of telling people in, in, in different occasions that uh, we worked for an oil company. So... That we have to remember how this has changed from being top companies to work for till people were literally afraid of <laughs> telling friends and families and, and others that, you know, we're working for these companies and which is just quite absurd. I mm. mean, Shell, BP, Equinor, Total, 
Exxon, Chevron, Occidental, you know, they're all great companies. They are providing energy to a world without energy and short energy. And uh, and we had a period of time that people were literally afraid of saying they're working there. So we've been through some very, very special few years here. Yeah, yeah. I had a friend of mine by my wife who's, who told me he worked for the world's largest biofuels company. Uh, this is during the pandemic. And it transpired that he worked for one of the uh, the privately owned trading houses. It was a bit of rebadging uh, with that exact in mind, right? You know, the, the, and I think it's something that the industry has to tackle. And I think the, there's two in track there. One is the caliber of the individual that the, the sector is going to be able to attract. You know, as you say, 25 years ago, Enron was drawing from the top schools in the United States. Equinor gets the best and the brightest. So does Petrobras in Brazil, for example. But also getting that message right, which is actually, if you want to affect change and you care about the the environment, you know, these are the organizations are the ones that are going to be leading it, not left behind. And I think that's a, a real challenge to the sector. And I, 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 I sort of, I hear you loudly on that one. That is kind of, I guess, ties into the final point, which is ESG was, as you said at the start, very much the story of 19, 20, 21 in the wake of energy security, in the wake of inflation, in the wake of volatility, it's it's dialed back some. Last year, the commodities trading sector faced real scrutiny just after the Russian invasion with some of the potential systemic risk coming from trading houses, essentially concerned over the liquidity and their ability to, to have a functioning market. Do you see greater regulatory scrutiny coming into commodities? And what would that mean for the hedge fund sector? I don't think we will see more scrutiny into the commodity market. I think uh, the oil market showed the world what a fantastic engine it is and how it all works. If the oil market was not as, you know, the way it is run, how it works, that you can produce, you can get to the port, you ship it, you can sell it to all these kind of different destinations. They receive the refined and they have a, a product to sell. I just think the, the oil market uh, showed their strength during the whole Russian Ukraine situation. And I think uh, the world should be grateful that uh, it works this well, that well. And uh, we did not have an even more severe problem. I think what we are now learning on the on the LNG situation, Europe and, and UK has decided to buy less from Russia or uh, literally take it down to zero, and that we see no supply, not only from US, but you know Peru was sending cargoes in. We saw from UAE, we saw from uh, Qatar and Australia, and uh, and Europe are able to receive it. We had some floating storage. I think it's quite. Uh, impressive as well the coal market we were shipping coal from australia all the way into europe all ports in europe and uh, december january february march was maxed out on on coal import and i think it's again quite impressive now, if you said uh, five to ten years ago that we will actually ship coal from australia in cape size in big scale most people uh, never believed in that story but uh, that just again shows the commodity market from a very positive uh, uh, angle. Also that uh, during the high volatility and some of the trading houses uh, obviously had uh, some issues on some uh, trade finance, not only because that uh, the banks in general have been pulling these lines and been less interested to be in the trade finance, but it's more that when the commodity prices are very volatile, they have to deliver the cargo, they get payments later, and they just keep having a lot of outstanding. And uh, I'm very, very happy for the grain houses and for all the, the big trading houses that they were able to get through this and uh, the way they did. I'm very happy that there was no one that uh, went down. It would have been absolutely the wrong uh, end of the story if they were the casualties out of the uh, Russian-Ukraine uh, situation. No, perfect. Well, we're, we're in danger of bearing the lead, as I typically do. Let's talk about Svelin Capital and, I guess, putting it all together. 
you know, what makes a fund successful, you know, and, and all those pieces that we've talked about, how does that fit within Svel and Capital and, and your I firm? set this all up, decided to put my name on the door just to show how committed I am. I have a majority of my my assets in the in the in the fund, so that uh, tells you my uh, commitment. We have done this for the long run. We have a very senior team in place, despite that we are a, a smaller fund, but we are at a level that we are, we are doing well, and uh, we have achieved now to have strong result over many years, and you know we even. <laughs> Winning prices, uh, which is indicating that we are are doing are doing well. So, like last year, we ended up almost forty seven percent. But uh, I think the more important thing is not last year; it's uh, that we are well north of thirty percent over the last four years. That's I think uh, is is the most important thing that we managed to make money in nineteen and twenty when the market was uh, not as uh, easy to trade as like we had done the the last few you two years and and how does that fit together i mean this is i guess you've got this the commodities piece long short you've got long short shipping and then the equities piece is shipping one of those sort of a filter for all of these different markets i mean what what do you think the secret of the success is you know the fact that you can trade across those sort of three buckets or shipping being central to your background kind of gives you a unique lens compared to someone who's may just focus on one fuel during the, the day-to-day operation next month and going forward is what i'm looking for is as opportunities the opportunities could be in the equity market could be in the freight future market it could be in the commodity market you know the most liquid products you will obviously trade more than the less liquid and i think it's important just to keep uh, looking for opportunities don't rush don't invest in something that you're not having a high conviction. Don't be too aggressive on the short side when when the market has uh, trended uh, down and you, you can't justify a, a, a large short based on uh, on the, the fundamentals. And the same on, on the long side. If you can't see it rally, you just keep it because you hope it will go further. It's rather take the profit, move on, and be very humble for what the market can surprise you. And uh, the equity market has a tendency to be ahead of themselves sometimes. And when everybody uh, is chasing the mining sector or the oil sector or, or the shipping sector, and all the equity research are out there with a bullish uh, research, normally the, the last standing bear has turned bull and it's time to take the other side. And also that the we use the future curve i think the future curve is telling us where we are heading what is the freight futures or the commodity futures that curve is much more important to read the market than the equity market i think in many cases the freight future market and the commodity future market they're more specialists involved and uh, the equity market is a less specialist so i t- have a tendency to more believe in the future curve uh, and the freight future curve than what equity market is, is uh, predicting. If if the VLCC market is being priced in from an equity point of view at uh, the next three years, we will make 50,000. And the Fed future market is telling us uh, a different story, like a more like 25, 30. I, I will, on a general note, more believe in that the Fed future curve is more correct. And the same on the what we have seen now lately, when the oil companies, uh, you know, they did not trade well in 2019-20. The oil market uh, had a big sharp sell-off in during the pandemic and then had a tremendous recovery. And, uh, you know, Exxon, the Equinor, the Shell BP was very much out of favor. And then the earnings kicked in and the investor realized, oh, we need to be involved there. And then they had the rally. And then the TTF and the, and the oil markets are coming off. And, and they were hanging up there. So because they start putting in estimates for, for years to come, that was at a very high level. And that's kind of, uh, if you trust your signal in the commodity market, both fiscal futures and the, and the freight futures, I think you, you read the market better. Are you, you know, if people are interested in swelling capital, you know, or investors, you know, are you 
still looking are you still attracting investors what what's the stage there yeah we are still uh, in uh, in dialogue with the uh, large institution to uh, be engaged and uh, i think we are now at a uh, uh, soon at 250 300 million dollars uh, level and um, i wouldn't be surprised that end of this year beginning next year that will we will could easily reach our capacity at 750 and uh, we rather be the, the number one goal is to continue having a strong performance than actually just grow and and uh, take uh, more AUM and uh, and uh, that will have influence on our overall performance so the number one for us is to keep a, a strong performance than rather be uh, small well, it's been a fascinating discussion. I think uh, I've certainly appreciated sort of a deeper understanding of what it takes to be successful and, and sort of the facets you need to think about and some of the market dynamics out there. And I think, you know, it's going to be a, a conversation that stands the test of time, um, you know, as we kind of go on through this, what is an incredibly sort of volatile space and, uh, and one driven from all of these different angles to the supply story you've mentioned. Thank you so much, Paul. It was a uh, very nice to invite me to be on the on the podcast uh, i'm a great fan of your podcast i'm listening to many of them and i'm learning every time i'm listening to them so thank you very much for having me on thank you for listening if you enjoyed this episode and want to support the show please give us a positive review on apple podcasts or spotify to find out more about hc insider and hc group a search and advisory firm dedicated to the commodity markets, visit our website at www.hcgroup.global. There you can find out more about our services and our offices around the world. There you can also find more content from interviews to insight pieces to more podcasts focused on the commodity value chains. Thanks again for listening.